God. Right, so we're going to try something different today rather than the, the other videos that I've done and it's going to be more like a lesson in terms of the tasks that I'm going to set you. So what you might want to do is press pause when I tell you to do something and then you can just go on with a, a little task. So you will need a pen and paper and a, no, or a notebook or something like that. All right, now we're going to be focused on analysing the poem, checking out my history in a little bit of depth today. Um, success criteria to understand the basic structure and form of the poem, to relate two of the context points and ideas behind the poem, and to recognise five key language features used by the poet in the poem. All right, now obviously some of you might only get two or three, that's fine, but this is me, me overall aim. And obviously it is more difficult with you not being able to ask questions. But if you're able to watch this, that means you've got the internet. So you've got all of the answers to the questions that you have at your fingertips. Don't forget, you can send me an email um, if you have any questions and I will respond. Right. So, in checking out my history, the title of the poem is quite important. And I want you to just take a couple of minutes to reflect on the title of the poem. I want you to think about history. What is history? So it's called checking out me history. What does this tell you about the poet or the poem? What do you think the poem will be about. So write down any ideas that you've got about the title of the poem in your workbook now. If you haven't got your at a grand sheet because we're not in the classroom, um, but any ideas that you've got about the title of the poem, spend a couple of minutes doing that now. Right, now we all learn history as part of our secondary school curriculum. We learn it even from the primary school and infant schools. We learn it from a very early age. I want you to think back over a recent history lesson. Um, obviously with the, the current situation, it's been a while since you've been in school, but maybe you are still being set history lessons, I would imagine. What was, what was it that you were learning about? So what have you learned about recently, even going back a couple of years, in history lessons? So make a list of the topics you've learned about, and I want you to think of the culture that these historical events relate to. Is it British culture, European culture? So think about the culture of the events that you've jotted down now. So second task is, to think about what you've learned about recently, make a list of the topics that you've been learning about, and then write down what culture these historical events relate to. Right. Did you think of the following? I mean, these are just some basic ones. The Napoleonic Wars. The Battle of Hastings, the First or Second World War. Right now, if you did think of anything like that, were you thinking of it from a British perspective, or were you thinking of it from a French perspective, or a German perspective, an American perspective? Set First and Second World War involved more than just England and Germany. So often when we think of history that we're involved in, we just think of us and British history. Right? What about Nanny of the Maroons, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, or Mary Seacole and the Crimean War? Right? Now, those three that I've just mentioned there, uh, last week's homework was to research on the people that are in 
um, checking out my history. So you should know a little bit about them. Um, but I just want you to think about Mary Seacole for a second and the Crimean War. If you would ask most people about a famous nurse from the Crimean War, they might not even know she was in the Crimean War, but most people about a famous nurse, they're going to say Florence Nightingale. Even if you look at the, the speedy built NHS hospitals that we've had over the, the last couple of months for the coronavirus, um, they've been called NHS Nightingale Hospitals. Not NHS sequel hospitals, right? Because we look at our history from our perspective, we look at world history from our perspective, and we don't think about other people's history. Mary Seacole was from a British colony and she helped out massively British people in exactly the same way as Florence Nightingale did. So, what culture are most of your history lessons from? Right, I would imagine they're from a British cultural viewpoint. Do you think it's important to know about history, firstly? Do you think it's only important to know about British history or are other cultural cultures, historical events important too? So try to think of something you know about the history of another nation. Right? This could be a former British colony like India or America, or it might be the history of somewhere associated with your own family. Right? We've got lots of different cultural backgrounds in our school. Right? That's one of the great things about our school. Right? So if you're from a different cultural back background than, just, than me, with a British background, can you think of any other things? Right? Now, at the bottom of the slide, it says share your stories with the class and consider as a group what made you remember those key events. Right? If you want to email me in a story about history from your cultural historical background, I would gladly read over that. Right? Because learning each other's stories or each other's history, because that's all history is, it's just a story. Learning each other's stories helps us to understand each other and helps us to understand who we are and that's the focus of this poem John Agard wanted to understand who he was and where he actually came from what his history was John Agard the poet wrote the poem you are now studying he was born in a South American country called Guyana and when Agard was a child, the country was known as British Guyana and was owned and ruled by Britain. So the schooling that Agard received there was very Anglo-centric, or in other words, it was centred around England and British views. So even though his country was from a massive, massively varied people and culture, he received essentially a British education because we were trying to anglicize the world right Empire. now in 1977 John A. Gard and his partner Grace Nichols another Caribbean port moved to Britain to pursue their dreams of being professional writers A. Gard has become an acclaimed port whose poem Half Cast has been a mainstay of the GCSE curriculum for many years. We don't study it anymore, but it is a fantastic poem. And also look up Grace Nichols' poems. She's also been studied at GCSE um, over the last few years. When you're looking at poets, don't just think, oh, well, I, I can only look at the poem that's on the, in the, the poetry anthology. It helps you to understand a poet if you look at other poems that they've written as well. Um, he was awarded the Queen's Medal for Poetry in 2013, joining the ranks of major poets such as Stevie Smith and Ted Hughes. You should recognise the name Ted Hughes. His favourite place to write, according to the Guardian newspaper, was in a pub with a pint of Guinness. Right? Now, at your age, I wouldn't recommend the second part, but 
you know, find a, a favourite place to write for yourself, and you'd, you'd be surprised as to to how much improvement that you could make, especially in this kind of time when you you do have lots more time on your hands. Hopefully, you are just using that time to be looking at your phones constantly, right? Spend a bit of time trying to improve yourself. Do a bit of creative writing. If you want some ideas for creative writing, again, just give me a, an email and I'll get back to you with some ideas. In the port on words, in an interview with the Guardian newspaper in preparation for receiving his Queen's Medal for Poetry, John Agard said the following things about poetry in life. Remember them as you read the poem, checking out my history. So, how will these thoughts from the poet inform your reading of the text? So you've all read the poem a few times, you've maybe done a little bit of extra research, but I want you to think now about how will these thoughts from the poet inform your reading of the text. The sooner we can face the fact that Western education is entrenched with preconceived notions of other societies, the better. It's healthy and liberating to question those perceptions. I want you to think about that. Think about what it is that he's saying. Right? So, we'll go back to the, the Second World War. Sometimes, we have a preconceived notion that all Germans wanted to take over the world. That all Germans were, were nasty and vicious and violent. That all Germans hated the Jews. No, that's not the case, right? But sometimes we get this preconceived idea, maybe because of TV programs that we've watched or, or movies that we've seen, right? But think about it. It's, as John A. God says there, it's healthy and liberating to question those perceptions. Now, sometimes our perceptions are correct. But often... They're a preconceived notion, they're a stereotypical thought, an idea, that sometimes we need to question. Part of the excitement of writing how you can give a voice to a certain character or people that are usually voiceless. So, what he's looking at there is, he specifically thought about the voice in his poem. Now, if the poem was... Checking out my history, would that stand out as much as checking out me history? Now, as you know, I, I, I don't mind making a fool of myself in the classroom. Um, so I generally read the poem in a kind of Caribbean accent. That's the voice that he's trying to eat, trying to put into this poem is trying to make us realise that this is not an English school child writing this but he's been educated like he would be if he was an English school child now through poetry you can make people reflect and you name an unnamed thing such as the absurdity of an expression right so One of the whole reasons for poetry, I'll have said this in the classroom before, that poetry is the thoughts and feelings of the writer written down in the best language available to them. Right? So a good poem, if poetry is the thought and feelings of the writer, should make someone else have thoughts and feelings about something. Now, through poetry, I'm just going to read what John Agard said again. Through poetry... You can make people reflect. Right? So, the whole point of poetry is to make people think. And sometimes it's just about making them think about the absurdity or the stupidity or just the general kind of lack of thought that we put into things that we say on a constant basis and things that we talk about on a constant basis. Now, 
if you haven't read the poem, I, I don't know where you've been, and you certainly didn't do your homework last week, um, but reading the poem for the first time, what did you learn from the first read? All right, so if you, if you haven't got your poem right now, your anthology, grab your anthology. If for some reason you didn't get your anthology before you left school, um, get yourself onto the internet now and read a copy of Checking Out My History. And just jot down what do you learn from the first reading. Now usually when people do this first reading of Checking Out My History, they learn a few names. Right? Every time he mentions someone that we always know and that you that most people will know, he then introduces the name of someone that you probably haven't. So you've probably learned a few extra people from world history. What is the story the poet is trying to tell? I want you to think about what what is the story the poet is trying to tell. So it's quite an important part, this one. Because, remember, history is made of two words that have been combined. So it's a kind of compound word. His story. Right? If you're going, going to go back in... History, history, there's a saying, history was written by the winners. All right, so if there's a battle and England win the, the, the battle against France, we get to really write in the history books how we won it and, and how much better we were, etc., etc. Right, that's the way it's always been. All right, so what's the story that the poet is trying to tell? What issues does he raise and how does he deal with them? So, what's one of the problems that he brings up? And then, how does he deal with that problem? Does he mock the problem? Does he become very sombre? Anything like that. I'd suggest... Take a few minutes, remember, when I've given you a task like this, pause it, and then continue the, the video. Right. So, compare the ways in which Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole are referenced in the poem. They were both women who went to the Crimea to help the soldiers during the Crimean War. How were they represented differently in Agard's poem. Right. Look at the images below. How are these two women who were contemporaries how are they presented in the two images? So what is the point that you think that John Agard is trying to make? I mean, if you don't know much about Florence Nightingale, one of her kind of nicknames was the Lady with the Lamp. Right, and you can see there from that image that she's all lit up. And it's like she's going to bring light to people. Light being a symbol of hope and life, etc. Whereas Mary Seacole just kind of doesn't exactly look like she's going to be inspiring and bringing life to people. So why are they represented in the ways that they are? Right. Now this poem is written in the first person. And you notice right away that the poet is using a Caribbean dialect in the text. So he's writing it as he would say it. Now, Agard discusses the fact that he was educated in a school in the Caribbean about many elements of British history and culture, including nursery rhymes and stories. He was not, however, taught anything about the key figures from his own Caribbean heritage, such as people like 
Tucson, Louverture and Mary Seacole. Now, by the end of the poem, the poet's determined to educate himself about his own cultural history. He knows that no one else is going to do it, so he is going to do it for himself. He's got this self-determination that he's going to find out things about these people because no one else is going to tell him. The poem is about cultures, identity and the impact of colonisation. He uses the language of the Creole, which is a kind of mixed English and African dialect. So you'll have to have some kind of English words mixed in with African words and sometimes called Pigeon English. Right? And he uses this to tell most of the story. Right? Now, often he refers to den, which means them. And looking through the poem, can you highlight in two separate colours the use of dem and me? Right? So if you haven't got a highlighter, just underline them so you can see where they relate to each other. Why do you think dem is used so often in the poem? And who do you think dem refers to? So just jot a little note down about that. Now look carefully at the later part of the poem. Can you see one small section of the poem in which Agard moves from the Creole dialect to standard English with standard sentence structure? Now this is a much harder one. Why do you think he does that? Much harder to, to think about for this one. So again, you've got the internet at your fingertips, you can always try and research that. So the final section describing sequel includes the lines, A healing star among the wounded. Right? So this is a standard English in a poem that's told in a non-traditional and non-standard English way. So why do you think he did that? Now, Agard refers to vision and sight many times throughout the poem. Try to find as many of the different references as possible. For example, bandage up me eye and a slave with vision. So, take a couple of minutes and try to find as many of the different references as possible to sight and vision. How many did you find? What was the most commonly used reference? And who is shown to have vision? Right? Now vision doesn't just mean what you can see. Right? In footballing terms, if a footballer's got vision, it's not just that he can see, but that he can almost see in advance. He can see where things are going. Right? So who shouldn't have vision and why do you think this is? Alright, let's look at some of the language in the poem. Why do you think the poet included the following words and phrases? What other words and phrases really stand out for you? Tucson de Thorn. Hopeful stream to Freedom River. I carving out my identity. De cow who jump over the moon. A healing star. Sea far woman of mountain dream. Right, so have a think about these. Maybe write them down and do like a spider diagram as to, to why you think the poet included those words and phrases. Right, and if there's any other words and phrases that really stand out to you, think about why the poet included them. Now, you've always got to remember the port has made a conscious choice to include these 
words and phrases to get a point over to his reader to make them think or feel something so why has he done this right, let's look at the structure the poetry began as an oral tradition right so that means it was just spoken and it was meant to be spoken rather than written down because most people going back for centuries could not write so if you go back to the the beginnings of poetry it was to tell stories and to tell history but it was done as poetry so that because the the rhymes and the alliteration and the, the defined structure would help you to remember those stories right but now we generally see poetry as something that is written down and that we read but let's look at this for many cultures including those of the African slaves sent to America and the Caribbean who were not allowed to learn to read this tradition continued oral poetry often features repetition strong rhythms and chanting style lines right so do you see any of those features in this poem right so repetition strong rhythm and a chanting style line so find have another look through the poem and see if you can find any of those but think why it's always why has the poet done this that's what you need to think about now the poem checking out the history is a poem in two styles so have a look at the poem again why does the poet put some lines in italics and others in standard font now sometimes when you're reading it online it's not always going to be in that case so if you've got your anthology it should be that way why are some of the lines so much shorter than others so some of them there are simply just a, a few syllables in the line and then some of them are much longer why what other differences do you notice about the different sections right so you look at them sometimes just looking at them not reading them and just looking at a stanza and then comparing that with the other stanzas is there one that's much longer is there one that's much shorter is there one that all of the the lines in that stanza are much longer just think about it and think about why sometimes it's to draw your attention to it so that that's the one that stands out so you might have in some poems defined structure of say eight lines in a stanza and then you get to the final stanza and it's just one line because the poet wants us to focus on that is there anything like that in this poem now a guard chose to write this poem in the first person again it's a very important decision that he's made so how does John Agard use the first person narrative remember narrative doesn't mean that you're you're writing a story just you have a form of narrative poetry which is a poem that tells the story so how does John Agard use the first person narrative here right he is a narrator telling the story from a first person point of view now check out the history as a poem of two slides a guard wants us to be aware of both the things he was taught at school and the things he did not learn in the mainstream curriculum that he feels are important he uses the physical separation of the stanzas and the font styles to indicate which culture he is referencing the sections written in regular font refer mostly to the British colonial education of his youth the lines are longer and more regular in form although the rhymes used are simplistic implying the lack of importance that a guard associates with these things the italic verses are more varied and show a level of sophistication of thought rhyme and rhythm some of them are chant like reflecting the oral nature of much of the Caribbean cultural material so the Caribbean poetry because they didn't have that education where they they were specifically uneducated so to keep them down 
they had to learn poetry as a way of expressing themselves through rhyme and rhythm and chant like so that they could remember it. A repetition, another oral poetry technique is also used. There's a use of metaphor, right? And it is reserved for the figures of black history rather than those from British culture. Right? So he doesn't use these flowery and more kind of elegant poetic techniques when he's talking about the British historical culture but he does when he's talking about people from his own part of the world. Now Agard also introduces nursery rhymes and folk figures into his discussions of British culture making the historic figures like Florence Nightingale and Lord Nelson seem more trivial. So what he's trying to do when he does this He's trying to portray that the British culture is kind of stifling. It's plain. It's regulated. Whereas the Caribbean cultural history is kind of enigmatic and enthusiastic. And so the, the, he just puts that greater emphasis into the poetic techniques that he's using to describe the people from his culture. Now, I want you to just think. This poem concentrates on the feelings. Remember, poetry is about the thoughts and feelings of the writer. Right? So this poem concentrates on the feelings of conflict and anger. The poem deals with many issues and themes which make it comparable to other poems in the Power and Conflict Anthology. What themes do you see in the poem? Right, just think about it. So, just... Scoot your mind over to Romeo and Juliet. You've got the obvious themes of love, death, fate, right? Things like that. What themes do you see in this poem by John Agard? Got individual experiences, memory. Identity, challenging authority, maybe not a theme that Mr. Redford wants you to think about. What other themes and issues can you see in the poem? So, if you've already got them, go back through and think about other themes. Right? It might not just be themes, it might be re reoccurring ideas right so think about the use of light in this poem and who is it that light is related to right now what do you think of the poem at the beginning of the lesson you were asked to consider three quotations from John Agard. Look at the following quotation again. Do you think John Agard has achieved some of these things in the poem? Share your ideas with a partner. Um, go downstairs, talk to your mum or dad about it or someone or your gran or your auntie Jean on Skype or FaceTime or whatever. I'd email me. I'd set up a Facebook room with people from the class and share your ideas with them. The sooner we can face the fact that Western education is entrenched with preconceived notions of other societies, the better. It's healthy and liberating to question those perceptions. Part of the excitement of writing, how you can give a voice to certain characters or people that are usually voiceless. 
through poetry you can make people reflect and you name and unname things such as the absurdity of an expression. Now some of these things from John Agard's really topical at the moment um, with the the killing of the the black man over in America um, George Floyd I think it is and the, the problems that are suddenly kicking off over there you've got riots taking place in the, in the in streets you've got houses being and sorry shops being broken into and looted and then burned to the ground you've got police cars being tipped over and why is that right because there are preconceived notions and ideas about people of color now obviously I can't understand everything that someone from that background is going through right now or has gone through in their life I can only really understand what I've gone through in my life but if we think about things and try to put ourselves into someone else's perspective and someone else's shoes and then what we need to do is take our shoes off first we can't see through someone else's glasses if we're still wearing our glasses you can't walk a mile in someone else's shoes if you've still got your shoes on so you've got to try and come out of all of your cultural preconceived ideas and see things from someone else's point of view that's what John Agard's wanting us to do here right he's wanting us to stop trying to put our opinions on other people and make us think right so the the riots that are that are that have been triggered since this I'm going to say killing um, of this young black man um, and all of the the videos that you might have seen or the posts about how black lives matter they do and usually these people are voiceless and we're trying to educate them in our way what about their history if you're from a different culture what about your history just think about these things are we learning each other's history are you learning even your own history does history even matter John Agard seems to think it does because he seems to think that where we are going to depends on where we've come from history is an incredibly important thing remember the, the old saying that if you if you choose to ignore history we are doomed to, re to make the same mistakes right so think about history checking out me history what are the thoughts and feelings of John Agard what's he trying to get over to you through this poem through the words and phrases that he selected why has he used certain techniques why is he structured it in a certain way? Think about all of these things and make some more notes in your anthology and don't forget you've got the internet so you can spend another hour researching those historical characters you can email me if you need help just try and learn more about this poem but concentrate on the thoughts and the feelings that it makes you have okay that's mr Portnout. out i'll see you after the lockdown is over bye bye